All right, well, hey, welcome to church this morning, and I want to welcome everyone online on YouTube and Facebook. Come on, put our hands together for everyone watching online. Um, well, hey, we had a great Easter. Everyone enjoy Easter service last week. Yeah, it was okay. Just above average or just on average. Great. Great. There we go. Thank you. Someone's excited. Well, we're in the middle of a series called Prepare for Impact. And it's kind of been the vein of this season we're about to enter into. We're not seeing this as just a few weeks. We're seeing this as preparation for the next season, which is about 12 weeks. Uh, there's about four seasons in a year. So, uh, so, so I was taught. Um, and, and so I believe God works in these cycles of seasons. Uh, but I also believe not, it's not just in the environment. I believe it's also relationally, also as a church. There's just something about the way God has created the earth and how it's all intertwined together. Uh, and so I believe as a church, we're in the same scenario where God is looking to do something. He's about to grow something. Can you get an amen? amen? And that's not just us collectively as a church. That's you individually, I believe. The God, this is a season for growth. This is a season for some cleaning Anyone done any spring cleaning? I'm not holding my hand up because I've done it. I'm just trying to lead you to put your hand up, okay? But my wife is unbelievable. Her, she can see things I don't. There's like, she tells me about dust. I don't see the dust. It looks good to me. I don't really get that close to the skirting board to see it, to be honest. Um, and so it's a time, I believe, for a bit of a spring clean, but also... The whole point is to prepare for growth. And I believe God wants to do the same in your life. And there's some things need to grow. And some areas need to be cleaned. Can you get an amen? amen. Don't nudge the person beside you. <laughs> and it was interesting. Um, we had family over. I think that's legal. We had family over. <laughs> Should I have said that? <laughs> Out the back. Anyhow, my lovely wife decided she wanted to prepare the house, to clean the house. And yet again, I was kind of roped in a little bit. She knew my capacity wasn't super high, but I could do something, take the bins out and so forth. Um, but, but as I watched her race around the house, just things were being hidden in cupboards She was down on her knees on the skirting board, putting all this new kind of food I'd never seen before, was going into the oven, a serious amount of preparation. She started, I think the event or, or the invitation was for the, the Sunday, and she started on the Saturday, and it was a, an all-day event. Our Saturday was gone because she was so keen to prepare for the family that were coming over to create a space that, that, that they could sense value, they could sense their that they, they've been appreciated, that, that someone actually cares for them enough to, to set the table, to clean the house, it had to be smelling right, had to be looking right, all the bathrooms, never, never been so clean, so much preparation so that when the event happened, everything worked out. And the food was perfect, and it was beautiful. It was like five-star treatment. And here's my family coming over thinking, it's like that Monday to Friday. Well, it is. <laughs> Be careful, Phil. Be careful. You're on the line. And so it's interesting. I've seen that scenario, and then I've seen another scenario where I've been doing this invite one we've been in a thing where we want to invite 5,000 people, and, and we're not going to set people's no for them. And I realized this week and previous weeks that, whoa, I've missed millions of opportunities to bring Jesus to somebody, to just spark a conversation. Millions. Probably thousands in the last week, and, and there's some things that just get in the way. And I'll give you an example. This week, I, I just, I, it was Friday, I prayed, God, just, I've been preaching this, so I better do it. Who, who, who should I give an invite today? If I was to give one person an invite, I, I just sensed just do what's in your hand, Phil. And I want to tell you the same. Just do what's in your hand. 
where are you going today? Well, the car needs fuel, so I'm going to stop at the shop. And I just sense, just give it to the person at the till. Didn't know who it was, who it was going to be. So that's like, right, that's fine. To be honest, I didn't do a devotion that day. I didn't pray. In the, I didn't really have a great prayer time that day. I wasn't really, I was kind of maybe chasing the day. Anyone ever been there? Where you're kind of, you get up and you're late. And because you started wrong, the, you're just chasing everything for the rest of the day. You don't really win the day. You just kind of survive the day. It's probably one of those days for me. And end up getting to the shop. It's like, flip, that's right. I've got to, I'm chasing. I've got to, got to give the invite card. Sense the Holy Spirit telling me, so I want to be obedient. Got into the shop, seen the person at the till, and I knew her. And I thought that should be a good thing. But all of a sudden, I got this feeling of, like, embarrassment. Ever taken a redner? I hadn't even done anything yet, but I felt embarrassed. I don't want to do this anymore. It was good when I was in the car, but as soon as I opened the door and I started to walk through the door, I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, I don't. not today. And then I, I still considered it a little bit for a while, and then I started looking at everyone else and started to worry about, what are they going to think when I give this to her? I'm going to make a scene. It's going to be a whole embarrassing scenario. Like, I'm, who is this zealous person coming into the shop making a scene. And I started to create all these kind of scenarios and ideas in my head, which, which weren't true, but I was still creating them, and I was, I was sensing anxiety and fear. But the Holy Spirit had convicted me to do something, and I failed. Can I be honest in church? Can we be a church where we can be honest about failure? So I left. I, just, I, I didn't do it. I didn't give the invite. Here's me preaching at the front. Let's do one invite one day. I didn't do it. I disobeyed the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I had to go back and reflect. Why did you not do that, Phil? What happened that you failed? What, what, what came against you that you couldn't make the invite? Because I knew I, could, I had the potential to do it, but I just didn't have the power. Some of us in our life right now, you have the potential, you don't have the power. And, and I had to then remind myself, wait, Phil, you're not a slave to fear. I, I remember that song. I'm no longer a slave. Is there any auto-tune <laughs> at the back to fear? I started to remember, oh, God has not given me a spirit of fear, so this is not me. That is not okay, and I'm not going to be beat. And so I'm going to get back to it. The next day I went in, the same girl was working, and I conquered the fear, and I said, I'm not going to go by my feelings because my feelings are going to make all kinds of stories up. My mind's going to make all kinds of ideas up. I'm just going to do it because that's who I am, and, and that's, I'm not, a, child of, I'm not a, a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I'm loved. I'm not going to let the fear of people stop me. I'm going in prepared. I know feelings are going to come at me of fear, I know I might feel a little bit embarrassed, but I'm going to do it anyhow because that's who I am. That's my identity. And I don't know, and listen, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I'm believing that God will breathe on it and I'm going to put it into his hands. And you know what? I came out feeling alive. I came out feeling, well, I've done something today that could change the destiny of this person. But I had to conquer the fear. And this is the story I want to talk about today because all of us go through this. There's not one person on the earth is exempt. No matter, there's no level that is exempt from fear, from distraction, from disappointment. And I realized, and I was talking to a few people yesterday just about how they'd actually been listening to a message online, and they were, it was actually my wife and her friend, and they kind of talked about in the message that when you get into a fight, any kind of resistance or story, the problem is when you get into the fight, you only bring what you have. You don't get stronger in a fight. You get stronger from a fight. You don't get stronger in a fight. When you're in the fight, when you're in the turmoil, you just bring what you've already prepared. The same way if your friends come over to the house, you can't go and do the shopping because they've already arrived. You only give them what you have in the cupboards. And what I realized in the first scenario where I failed was I brought what I had, but what I had wasn't enough. 
I had potential. I didn't have power. And you know why? Because my preparation was wrong. What does it say? If you prepare, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. What I realized when I was preparing this week, I go, what is the message you want to give to our church this weekend and even to me? Is there's a fight before the fight. The fight before the fight. And if you don't win the fight before the fight, you'll probably not win the fight. And the fight is a fight of preparation and of power. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your holy presence in here. God, I ask you to move to help me to bring your word, a word of encouragement, a word of discernment, a word that lightens up situations where we feel and where we've messed up and help us to tap into the power that allows us to win and to overcome. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. The fight before the fight. Listen, this whole year, if we're honest, has been a fight. And here's the reality. There's people in this room and watching online, and some of you have won the fight. Some of you have been preparing for any kind of fight because you've been in prayer, you know the Bible, you've rehearsed the Bible, and you've also meditated on it day and night or regularly to the point where the power has been ignited and you've been able to react well to this year. There's maybe only a few. Maybe you've, you've won a few days, a few months, a, f- a few weeks, and, and you've lost a few others. And that's, it's important to be real about it. Because if I didn't go back and assess my failure, I couldn't have overcome. The Bible says we are more than conquerors, but you must realize first that you can be conquered before you can overcome and prepare to overcome. Well, for that sounds good. Is that bi- even biblical? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Some of you in, uh, in here, if you're honest, do you feel this year? You haven't won. You, you're actually, you've came to the end of this whole COVID thing and you're beat up. You're discouraged. You've started to believe things about yourself that aren't true. And they're certainly not what God believes about you. And you fe- you've failed yourself. You've become a bully to yourself. And you certainly haven't taken the opportunities that God has in front of you. And it's okay to be real about that because that's where you begin to overcome. What did I say? When you come to a fight, you only bring what you have. And so you might lose one fight. You don't get stronger in the fight. You get stronger from the fight, even if you lose. I love the scriptures that it says in the Bible that God uses all things together for the, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means even when you feel, even when you mess up, even when you sin, if we're honest about it and we're real about it, we can get back to the drawing board and say, what do I need to do to overcome? So we got to be okay. God, God's love allows us to deal with our sin allows us to deal with feeling him and feeling others so that we can overcome. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so we're going to talk about a guy in the Bible whose whole destiny and purpose on the earth was to prepare a way. His name is John the Baptist. And if some of you know the story about John the Baptist, what was happening with John was, I didn't see some of these things before, but Jesus we know the story, some of us know the story of Mary and Joseph, and they became pregnant supernaturally. And so this is a, they faced all kinds of probably resistance from friends and family and people thinking they had sex before marriage, and, and it was so shameful in that, in that culture, that was a devastating blow to them. So they're, they're, they're already thinking this is a nightmare. But, but it's interesting, I didn't realize this, but, but actually John came slightly before Jesus. And Elizabeth and Zachariah, let me make sure I've got this right. Yes, I have. Zachariah and Elizabeth were John's parents, but they're also related to Mary and Joseph. And so Mary heard of Elizabeth having a baby, and an angel appeared to them both, appeared to Zachariah and Elizabeth, but also to Mary and Joseph. And so it's as if God sent an angel to Mary and Joseph, but he also sent a person to help. 
See, some of us in here, you're trying to conquer and possess the power that God has for you to overcome fear, anxiety, depression, problems. But God doesn't just send an angel or his voice. He also sends people. There's a person. Mary had Elizabeth, John's mother. And so she, she actually went to visit her, probably to ask, hey, what's going on? Did that happen to you? Did the angel appear to you too? Are you struggling with this too? Did those people say that to you too? Did, did, did those people stop talking to you too? It's not fair, is it? What's going on? What's God doing? What, why is this happening to me? Why did I lose my job like that? Sometimes the best thing you can do when you're going through some stuff is go find somebody who's went through it too. Or not just went through it, but going through it. Go through it together. I really sense the season we're in as a church, we've been apart for so long. And we've progressed in some ways, but we've also went back in others. We haven't been together, so we ha- how can we grow relationally together as a family apart? You can't. So we're going to go in this next season, and if there's a chance for a barbecue, we're going to get a barbecue going. If there's a chance for a party, we're going to have a party. If I need to go get Nogaletto in three weeks in a row to get you back to church and into rhythm, we're going to get Nogaletto three weeks in a row. (laughs) Because relationship is essential. It's important to overcome. The reason I went back into the shop was also because of you. I'm accountable. I want to play... I want to be a good team player. I want to play my part to help the fire burn bright so we can make a difference together. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so here we have John the Baptist. The Bible tells us that that he felt called and led to the desert to prepare a way for the Lord. That was his role in life, just to prepare a way. People actually thought he was the Messiah. And he kept saying, no, it's not me. They thought he was Elijah. No, 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 it's not me, but there's one coming that I'm here to prepare the way for, because if, I can w- if we can win the fight before the fight, interesting, interesting point. God, the God of heaven and earth, who created the stars, the moon, all that stuff, thought it was a good idea to prepare a way. <laughs> he thought it was a good idea to send and a- 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 bring this man, John the Baptist, for the Savior, to prepare a way for, for Jesus. I thought Jesus was a miracle worker. I thought he, he was, but he still needed to prepare the way. He still needed a, a path of preparation. Who's to say you don't too? Who's to say you don't need to prepare a way and, and create space for preparation for your day? You see, you know what prayer is? Preparation. Where do you access power? In prayer around people. That's where the power is at. That's why the church is essential. It's not just something you do. It's essential if you want to overcome. You cannot do it without it. I honestly believe, why would God send John the Baptist if Jesus didn't need him? He's seen it as essential. He realized Mary's going to need Elizabeth to get her through this. He knows that you need a friend you need a community of believers who believe the same thing. The only, they don't just believe it. They will speak life into you when you don't believe it yourself. Yeah. It's not just enough. It's more than enough. There's ample amounts of fuel here. There's ample amount of gifts here to stoke a seer's fire that is contagious. There's ample power in this room to do what God wants us to do. There's ample. There's more than enough. You're more than a conqueror. God has given you more than you need. Why? So you don't have to just deal with yourself. You can actually go help someone. You can be an Elizabeth to a Mary. Can I get an amen? You know, it was a few years ago, I was going through a few dark months or even years, and it felt like a desert. Funny that we see in the Bible, John the Baptist prepared where? In a desert. Jesus prepared where? Right before his ministry, 40 days, 40 nights in, in a desert. There's something about seasons of barrenness. There's something about seasons of nothingness, a bit like COVID, eh? 
where, where you're restricted, your normality is not there. There's something about it in, in regards to preparation. And it's not pretty. It's not a season where everything's just rosy and everything's, uh, you know, colorful. The desert is not colorful. The desert is boring. It's hot. It's a place where you've got to nearly dig deep to survive. Some of you maybe have felt that this year. Maybe discouraged to the point of like, I just got through. Well, maybe, maybe you learned some things this year. Maybe you failed some places this year. And that's helped you to learn of what's important and what you need. Maybe when things were stripped back and the noise of the world and the noise of online and the noise of, of the desires in your heart to go shopping and to be busy, maybe they were getting in the way. Maybe you needed the desert. Maybe God has prepared you this year, if you want, to do something like you've never done it before or never would have done it without a desert. Jesus, what is it? Jesus took... 30 years. Jesus lived, for those of you who don't know, Jesus lived 33 years on the earth, and he took 30 years to prepare before he felt the time was right for ministry, and he'd done three years. You know, that tells me that preparation takes way longer <laughs> than we think. I had dreams of seeing some of this stuff happen the guts of 17, 18, 19 years ago, and I was ready 17, 18, 19 years ago. But there was a preparation. There was a desert. Some of you have went through this year and hurt has come to the surface and it's not a bad thing. Disappointment, you're, you've never been as disappointment, uh, disappointed in your life. You've never been as scared in your life. But maybe the desert is a place for true identity to rise to the surface. Maybe the crutches that you've been leaning on need to go. The things that have just been disguising strength, disguising your confidence as something, but it's not true confidence because when it's all gone, what do you have? A crutch. When the crutch goes, you will feel fear. You will feel potentially anxiety. But what are we going to do with it? Are we going to keep believing ourselves and, and leaning on our own strength? Or are we going to lean on a God who has called us, that loves us? The same way when I came back from failing in the shop, I had to go back and ask myself, why could I not fulfill that? Why could I not do it? Why did I not have the strength? What's wrong? And my identity told me, no, I can do that. But, but my feelings told me I can't. So I had to go and revisit and, and rejig and renew my mind and, and, and change my belief systems and, and just actually give myself a dose of faith so that when I went in, I was prepared and I was ready. The question is, are you prepared? Just go and look, look one. Verse 15, it says, For he... He will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He will never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Who knows that drinking wine is not good preparation? <laughs> if you want to make some sense of what you're trying to do. But instead he was filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. How? Through the power. How? Through the preparation. How? From the fight before the fight. He will prepare the way. You know, preparation sometimes looks like waiting, as I just said. I guess sometimes this year... I was thinking, right, I'm just going to wait for this thing to be over. And waiting for me just looked like, ah, oh, what's on tonight? Come on, Netflix is rubbish. Like, give me a buzz or something, I'm wrecked. Like, someone do something for me. Like, I'm discouraged. Why, like, why not liking that? 
raging at that. I'm going to go on to Amazon see, Prime to see if they've got any movies. Flip sick. Wrecked. Lord, I'm waiting on you. Do something. I'm bored. Let's, let's be honest. That's how a lot of us live our life, especially our Christian life. Just waiting on the Lord. Bored. It's like, come to church, entertain me. Flip sick. Do something different. Like, I've heard that song three times. Like, give us a new one. Like, if you've not heard the latest one on Spotify, flip me. Like, what are you doing? Like, coffee? Like, what? coffee before, I want it after. Stop changing things. Them biscuits, they were better last week. Entertain me. I don't have to make biscuits. I don't have to buy biscuits or anything. Sometimes the church can just be like that. We come as a, a customer. Give me something. Pay my dues. I'm out. We miss the whole point. You see, when we talk about preparation, I think about my wife preparing the room for my family. It was active. It was like, people can't even see that, Anna. Why are you dusting under the speaker? We're preparing a place. I care. I want people to come in and enjoy it. I want people to come in and, and, and sense a freshness in the air. I want people to have a blast and for see when when the when the excellence is in the room when preparation is done right it creates a comfort which which allows relationships to pick to connect it, it it creates an environment in the same way in order for a plant to grow it needs the right environment the right setup the church we've been changing things for the whole year just there's just something new every week and the lesson we've learned is if we prepare well with the worship, if we prepare well with the sign, if we prepare well with the cleaning, then the weekend goes so much more smoothly. There's more power for relationship. There's more power to invest into people and not process. It's more effective. Have you ever seen, if you owned a restaurant and you told one of the employees, the waitresses who was waiting, or the waiter who's waiting on the next customer coming in, to, to go ahead, go and wait and get ready, and they were lying on the sofa, what would you say? They were sitting at the table waiting on people coming in, playing on their phone, and that's the way they were waiting, what would you say? <laughs> you, you say, get up and get ready. Because as a restaurant, we wait ready. We don't wait lethargic. We don't wait with no expectation. We wait ready as if we're ready for someone to come in through the door, and we're ready to serve, and we're ready to, to make their experience easy, and to make sure it's a success, and make sure they get the food that they want, and make sure communication is clear, make sure the environment is set. Why? Because we're there for that purpose, and that's how we succeed. Is, but what about your walk with God? Are you ready? Are you prepared for God to move every day? Are we prepared to hear the Holy Spirit by asking the question, hey God, what do you want to do today? Who do you want me to give an invite to today? Are you prepared? Because if you're not, you won't succeed. Don't expect to see any kind of result if you're on the sofa just waiting for God to do something. I'm just waiting on God. That's not how God works. You know if, if you have a restaurant like that, it's shutting down. You know that the customers that do come in aren't coming back because you weren't ready. You weren't prepared. You're in the fight, but you failed. And listen, you can learn from it. But if you want to get into a rhythm of growing and a rhythm of, of succeeding, in any area of your life, it's going to look like the fight before the fight. Can I get an amen? amen. It says in verse 76, and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High. We're talking about John. Because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. I just want to love people. <laughs> love is love. You know, really what we're saying is I just want to be surface. I just want to tell everyone you're amazing, you're lovely. Everything's fine in your life even though you're falling apart. Your class. Best person I've ever met. Love you. <laughs> Been to some places on this earth, and that's all you, some people, they're so encouraging, but you'll never grow. 
You'd be walking off a cliff edge and they would say, you're amazing, keep going the direction you're going. Life is class. Just keep running. It's brilliant. You're, oh, keep going. Bam, boom. But it says, he came to call people into repentance. Whoa, that's a bit heavy, Phil. That's a bit, bit deep. To find salvation through the forgiveness of their sin. Sin, sin. I don't want to talk about sin. That's heavy. It's a bit beneath the surface. That's a bit deep. Like we're gonna, we have to deal with people's problems then. We've got they've got, we to get them to a place where they understand they might have an issue. We've got to trust that God will still work with that even though they might fight me as soon as I say something beneath the surface because they're going to feel rejection and get mad. And have, you ever, have you ever been a kid? Have you ever seen a kid when they're corrected? Hate you. Why? Because it hurts to know that you're a sinner. It hurts to know that you got it wrong. I'm sure some of you parents have been told by the very child that you've put all of every ounce of your effort, emotional effort, physical finances, and then the next thing you correct them and try to help them and you fight for them and they tell you, I hate you. <laughs> what? Are you signed up for this? But really what's going on, you really, you know, they don't hate you mo- most of the time, I think. But what they're really saying is this hurts. But John's saying, if we're going to prepare a way, we've got to dig deep. I'm trying to plant a hedge at the minute. <laughs> Told you about that one, haven't I? But I'm now starting to go on the grass. Actually, I was looking into artificial grass. And I've got to be careful with this analogy because I don't want you to be artificial people. But the one thing I did learn when I was going to a guy, I'm trying to research and big sturdy helped me out and asking everyone trying to figure out because everyone's busy at the minute, all the builders are busy and I'm like, am I going to have to do this myself? So I started getting all this info about sub-bases and you got to get the cement and the, the screed, screening. What is it, Stuart? It's great, thanks, mate. Something like that. Get the sub-base, you got to get six ton of that, and then you got to get another uh, dust, some kind of dust over the top to line it, or sand, or something like that. What is it? Uh, granite dust, something. That's one of them. So a bunch of options. And, and, and what I kept hearing time and time again is, if you don't prepare this right, Phil, it will not last the test of time. There will be holes. It will be uneven. It will not even look half good. Because you didn't prepare it right, and honestly, the, the preparation is a lot of money. And you've got to dig deep. There's good soil there at the minute. Why can we not just fire the grass on top? I was definitely tempted to do that. But everyone I'm talking to that's got experience and wisdom in this area, they're saying you've got to get down at least probably six inches. You're going to have to take a ton of soil out, good soil. You've got to dig deep if you want it to last. And it's the same with us. We, we, we can't just do surface with God. We can't just do surface with people. You can't tell me when Mary went to Elizabeth and she's freaking out over her life, just upside down, inside out. You can't tell me she wasn't sharing, I'm scared. I'm afraid, like, can I pull out? I, I don't know if I want to do this. You can't tell me she wasn't going deep. She wasn't talking about her true emotions, her true feelings. You can't tell me for someone to heal up When you realize this year that, Flip, I've got some issues deep down in the subconscious. I believe some things about myself, and they're not producing good fruit. They're producing toxic fruit. I'm attracting myself to the wrong people, and I don't know why. There's something deep that needs fixed. There's something deep that's too soft. We need a more solid base. There's something deep that needs to layer a sub-base that's going to hold... Wait. And I believe that's why deserts can be designed to develop you and move you forward if you're prepared. And if you use those moments to help you. See, preparation is a process that digs deep. And then it goes on to say, In verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. So the whole point, we're preparing a way, the whole point that John came 
and he dug deep and he spoke to peoples and called out sin and asked for repentance wasn't just to make them feel bad or to hurt them. It's to bring them to a path of peace into light. We're not trying to hurt people. I'm not trying to hurt you. We're trying to bring you to the, the path of peace into a new life. And it looks like first dealing with failure, dealing with sin. This thing that we all have, no one's exempt from. But there is an answer and there is a solution and there's a path to peace. Let me give you this example. This was my beautiful wife's birthday uh, on Friday. Come on, put our hands together for Anna. She's on a camera somewhere. And you know, I had to step up, you know, first birthday Mary, got to make sure I'm preparing away, you know, for all those lovely meals she cooks. Got away, I'm got to make sure I'm preparing, encouraging, uh, you know, healthy growth. And so we decided to get a hot tub, you know, one of those wee rental hot tubs out the back and uh, fired that thing up to 40 degrees. Oh boy, unreal. But it was interesting one thing we were doing. And I, I remember I had a hot tub before and it was just one of these things that I, I wanted to show Anna. She loves like looking at the stars in the sky and it is beautiful, but I, I Honestly, if I'm honest, I never look at the stars in the sky because why would I be outside when it's that cold? You know, I'm going to be inside with all the artificial light, and that'll, that'll do. I'll just be warm and comfortable, and it's easy. Anyhow, we got the hot tub, so we were outside, and we're just kind of enjoying it and put the bubbles on for a bit, take them off, <laughs> living the dream, feeling encouraged, Anna's loving life, and I said, you know, there's lights on in the kitchen there, and they're, they're kind of beaming outside. We can't really see much. Let's, let's see if the, the stars are out tonight. But I realized we can't really see it with the light on, so we actually had to go take out the artificial light in the house. And when, we, when all the lights were out in the house, then all of a sudden we could see the stars clearly. All of a sudden, it exposed the light from, from the earth, from, from the universe, and all of a sudden, as we looked to the heavens and we seen all of the stars, it was, a, it was a state of awe. And you're like, why have we not done this before? These stars are probably out here, you know, hundreds of days, you know, maybe tens and hundreds of days a year, potentially, but we never see them because we're stuck inside doing our thing inside the artificial light. And as soon as we started to look and I seen a shooting star and this is, this is kind of, it's, it's changing my perspective. I'm not kind of thinking in my own little world, my own little problems. I'm starting to think bigger than that. I'm starting to think, oh my word, like it's, I forgot that God is that big. I forgot that this world is, <laughs> is ama more amazing than I'd maybe believed in recent times. I forgot the majesty of God, the power of God, that, that those, there are millions of stars in the sky and I'm a speck on earth, but God still chose me, still loves me, still knows me, still speaks to me. And honestly, I would say from that moment, it, it shifted perspective. It in some ways prepared my heart that when I seen true light, I became encouraged. I receive power. I receive perspective. I, I would actually, I'm tr I find it easy to convince you, uh, at least I, I hope you sense that I, I really enjoyed it, that it really meant something. It shifted me. And I think that the same way when we get that kind of power in prayer, that kind of power through just looking at creation, it's a lot easier to convince people that you believe in God. It's a lot easier to, to, to actually understand that the Holy Spirit could be a real thing and could actually speak to you and you could obey it and stuff could happen, miracles could happen, people could get healed. It's, it's a lot easier when you see that. But sometimes the lights have to go out in the artificial world, in the world that you control, in the scenarios that you think you know all about. Sometimes the desert, where well, what's going on in the desert is that there is no artificial light in the desert, is there? There's no light switches in the desert. There's nothing in the desert. It exposes the greatness of God. It exposes the majesty of God. Maybe there's a reason why Jesus and John 
find power and possess power, inherited power in the desert because they were able to put the switch off of what the voice of the crowd are saying, what, the, what people think, and they were able to focus on the goodness and the greatness of God the Father. And then they walked into a season of impact because the preparation, the fight before the fight had been won. And what I'm saying to you right now is that you can give light if you have light. You can give light if you possess light. But sometimes the artificial light that you control needs to be put to the side, needs to be switched off. The voice of Instagram, the voice of Facebook, the voice of caring what other people think. You need to get in, we need to get into a place like a desert where there's nothing. And sometimes life offers you those opportunities. And sometimes you have to decide to pray and to fast. That's why as a church we pray and we fast. John the Baptist he lived a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. What is that? It's basically just, just saying, I'm going to win the fight before the fight. I'm going to go to training so that by the weekend I'm ready. When I get into the game, I'm not lost. I'm ready. I'm going to prepare my heart today in prayer. At some part, whether it be in the car whether it be you find it just a little moment where there's nobody around, I'm going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to prepare the heart before I go and do something for God or I, I, I go and give an invite. I'm going to actually just ask the Holy Spirit and wait. God, put something in my heart. I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to do it. And if I fail, I'm just going to assess. I'm going to see, okay, this is potentially the problem and I'm going to address the problem with what the Word of God says I'm no longer slave to fear. I do not possess a spirit of fear, but one of sound mind, self-control, and of power. And I'm going to dig deep. And this season of digging deep mightn't just be surfacy. It mightn't feel good, and that's okay. My expectations are that. If I have to go into the shop, I might feel fear and worry, and I might feel feelings that people might look down upon me, but I'm not going to listen to those feelings because I'm the boss of my soul. If those, if those feelings whisper to me, I don't, no, you don't have power. I'm not accepting that. I'm the umpire of my own soul. God has given me free will. What is it in your life that's holding you back? What are the thoughts that you have about yourself which are wrong and you need to say, no, yes, you can chirp. I'm telling you, if you ignore that, that voice long enough, what's the Bible say? Resist the devil and he will flee. You have the power. You have the authority to say no and say yes to God. You have the authority to plan and to prepare your heart every day. You have the ability and possess the potential to make a difference. But I'm telling you, if you just show up unprepared, not ready, you're probably going to get discouraged and you might even fail. But only because you fail doesn't mean it's over. It just means you have feedback. You take the feedback And you fix it. And then you get into a rhythm of winning the fight before the fight. And you start to see fruit. And you start to see long-lasting impact. And you start to lay a sub-base and a layer that, that lasts the test of time. And you start to cast seeds and, and fire invites out. And you don't have to understand what's going to happen because you put them into God's hands. And you get excited and anticipate in faith like a waiter does as, as they anticipate people coming into the shop. When the first person comes, I'm ready. I'll make their experience the best it can be. I'm going to work as unto the Lord. And I'm going to leave the rest with the Lord. I'm telling you, you will start to succeed in life 
Because there's nothing more attractive to the human spirit than somebody with faith, with hope, and with love. And it's not just a faith in a random tree. It's a faith in a person that came, that lived, and is still the most popular man that ever lived. And the book that was written that all pointed towards the pinnacle of the cross on Calvary is still the most popular book that was ever written. <laughs> and I don't care where you're from or what you believe, there's one book that the universities are studying. There's one book that people are trying to disprove. <laughs> and it's the Word of God. Why? <laughs> because it's got power. Why? Because there's prophecies, hundreds of prophecies that were fulfilled and we can't make sense of. In the same way you look to the stars in the sky and I don't make sense of it. It's beyond a short circuit. Anyone else short circuit when you look at the stars in the sky because I don't understand. There's a mystery and that's okay. And as I hand invites out, there's a mystery. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm anticipating. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm digging. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm preparing my heart. I'm believing for miracles. I'm believing for amazing days ahead. And as a church, we're preparing a way. We're John right now. We're going to give Jesus an essential preparation that he needs. Jesus left towns and cities because the ground was not prepared. He was not honored, so he could not do miracles in those places. The heart was hard. It's essential to prepare. It's essential to win the fight before the fight. Let's go ahead and stand. So we're going to go ahead and respond. And, and there's maybe some people online in person. And it, it's your time. It's your time to receive new life. It's your time to dig deep. It's your time to win the fight before the fight. You're made for purpose. We know that. You've been designed to make a difference. You have gifts. We know that. But that's not, you need to win the fight before the fight. You can't really live on purpose with a purpose that lasts eternal without winning the fight over sin. The fight before the fight. And Jesus came for that. He's not scared about your sin. He's not scared about your past. He's not scared of your failures. He's not scared of even if you fail in the future. He came to pay the price for your past, present, and future sins. To allow you to learn, to grow, to become a follower, a learner. He's ready. He, he first loved you. What does that mean? He prepared a way for you. And all you have to do to win the fight is to receive the free gift of salvation. What does that mean? He's paid the price. He covered your tab. And all the debt that you had for all those lies and all those mistakes on purpose that you made called sin, he's paid for it. You just have to say, thank you. I receive it. I f I I I'm deciding to follow you. I trust you. I'm putting my trust in you. I don't understand it all, and I don't need to, but I, I sense the Holy Spirit moving. I'm just going to obey it. So let's say this prayer together. Church is every head bowed and eye closed. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who paid the price for my sins. I commit my life to you as the Lord of my life, I surrender. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. God, we just thank you.